What's the word, y'all? James Harden made his Philadelphia 76er debut today, and I am here to overreact. Every single YouTube channel you will watch today, every podcast you will listen to will overreact to game number one. And I'm saying it's an overreaction because James Harden, if you remember, when he first got traded to, to the Brooklyn Nets, he had a 30-point triple-double in his very first game. And you see how that ended. But I'm still going to come here to overreact because today – they, it, it was everything I expected and more. And I don't mean a, like the sense of dominance between the, the big three. Yes, we're calling it a big three because Tyrese Maxey is that nice. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the, the foul thing, the free throw attempt thing. It's, it's exactly it's exactly what we expected it to be. Now, today, uh, there was a lot of games on, and I will be talking about a lot of these games. So I actually did write notes as I was watching. It's not a thing that I typically do on this channel, but it, it felt I felt... Like I wanted to put in a little bit more work in. So, you know what I'm saying? So I get my facts right. Me and the homies were sitting in a party watching these games together. And, and one of the questions that came up was, are the Philadelphia 76ers a super team? How do you, and this is just a question I'm posing to y'all. Are they a super team? And I'm not just basing it off the one game, but based on their roster construction. And two, what is your definition of a super team? Let me know in the comment section. But man, James Harden coming out in his first game having 27, 12, and 8. Played it all great. And let me read you some of my notes because, again, I was watching this game and when something crazy happened or something I didn't expect or just something great happened, I put it in my notes. The first one was James Harden moved without the ball. Now, this wasn't a consistent thing. He wasn't just roaming the entire time. He didn't turn into Steph Curry overnight. But there were times where Joel B had the ball or, or Tyrese Maxey had the ball. And instead of just standing there uh, and being a threat because he wasn't standing very deep and James Harden as a catch two player is really, really good. But instead of him just being a threat based off him just being on the court, he was moving. It was one specific play in the second quarter and this is where I got my notes from where he was sitting at the top of the wing something happened on the left side of the court he was on the right wing and he he slowly crept his way to the corner and got an open three-pointer and I'm like yo James Harden must be super happy right now since he's moving without the ball and one of the main reasons why this trade is is such a good one for the 76ers forget whether or not they win a championship this year yada 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 it's because it lightens the workload for Joel Embiid Joel Embiid ended up this game with 34 points 10 rebounds some a, a steal three assists and and it didn't seem like a crazy super dominant 32 it was a low-key 32 and that's that just shows you how much of a load has been taken off his back because he did have James Harden to do his thing to create for him a lot of the times Joel Embiid early in the season and, and one of the reasons why he's an MVP candidate might be the MVP leader is because he created like all the buckets by himself we talk about the center that would get the ball and run up the court and isolate and do a crossover step back three-pointer a lot of his buckets today yes he did have his isolation stuff too but a lot of his buckets feel like they were generated by other people around him and that's the James Harden effect people questioned how they would work together and again we overreacted to one singular game um, about how Joel Embiid is not a vertical lob threat there were a few times in this game where just based off like based off muscle memory James Harden like threw a lob and it was just too high for Joel Embiid but he, he would get the ball and just go straight up instead of the the one motion that Clint Capella used to do or or um, uh, Nicholas Clax used to do, which is catch and dunk it. Joel Embiid would catch the ball, come back, and just go right back up with a real soft layup. And we've talked about the Joel Embiid progression on this channel multiple times, but there's a play again in my notes that says, um, Joel Embiid cross-corner pass to George Niang. I don't know what quarter this happened, but I was so impressed by it that I wrote it in my notes. And, and one of the, the best things about the James Harden trade is the fact that Tyrese Maxey is still on the team. Um, and this goes all the way back to the first time James Harden requested out of Houston. If you remember, uh, uh, Ben Simmons was looking for houses in Houston because he just figured that that trade was going to go through. And one of the reasons why it didn't happen is because the, the Houston Rockets were really trying to get Tyrese Maxey. And at that point of his NBA career, Tyrese Maxey was a good young player. And he's still a good young player, but he hadn't shown that much. But the 76er organization saw him as a potential building block. And they were like, we want James Harden so much, but we're not willing to give you Tyrese Maxey and the same conversations held with the Brooklyn Nets we're not willing to give you Tyrese Maxey we're not willing to give you Matisse Stiebel who ended up with three steals today and that is one of the best things about all of the moves that the 76 have done over the last couple years is they are able to keep a guy Tyrese Maxey who is the third best player on the team I will say it's so crazy that Tobias Harris is getting paid all that money for him to be the fourth fifth, fifth option and even if the, they don't win a championship this season there's conversations at the trade deadline about teams willing to take on Tobias Harris's contract as a salary dump so even if they can't win a championship this year with this this roster construction James Harden is still playing like this Jordan B still be playing an MVP all-star level Tyrese Max is gonna be better now you got cap space 
Because when Cease Tyve was going to be on his small deal, and pretty much everybody on their bench is getting PT, it's like on a rookie deal or a minimum deal. So again, this might not be the year for a championship for them this year, but I mean, it's a possibility. But if it's not, if it doesn't happen this year, and James Harden actually picks up that player option, which he said he did, but just suspiciously, the paperwork didn't go through, they'll have some money this offseason if they could put, pull off a Tobias Harris trade, and this team could be better. It's kind of wild to even think about. And I saw a tweet earlier today, and it made me do some Googles. Yes, I did a little bit of research today. Somebody said, shout out to Mike Muscala, the real king of Philadelphia. And that made me think, like, why the heck is Mike Muscala getting love today in Philadelphia? And I was trying to think, oh, was the Tyrese Maxey pick traded for Mike Muscala once upon a time? So I did a little Google search and listened to this wild story of how Tyrese Maxey ended up on the 76ers and why that's related to Mike Muscala. I might be out of the loop. You might know this story already, but I, I don't know. I ain't been keeping up. And I'll link this in the description if you wanted to read the whole article. I'm just going to read the first couple paragraphs because this is so very interesting to me. Mike Muscala is a Philadelphia 76er legend, not because of his 47-game tenure he played with them on the 2018-2019 season or because he's the only player in the NBA to play his college ball at Bucknell. I didn't even I didn't even really realize that. Or even because of Super Mario 3 tattoo. I didn't even know he had that. Look at me learning stuff like a lot today. But because he nearly single-handedly landed the Sixers Tyrese Maxey. Yup, you read that correctly. In the summer of 2020, August 12th to be exact, Mike Muscala hit a three-pointer with 5.2 seconds left and the Thunder's penultimate game i don't even know what that word means of the season to officially secure his team a spot in the play-in tournament it also funny enough satisfied the conditions of the first round pick owed to the 76ers by the orlando magic which the team then used to draft maxi at 21st overall a few months later this random jump shot with 5.2 seconds to go got the philadelphia 76ers tyrese maxi that is absolutely insane to me, how, how things like that can work. It's, it's a domino effect. So things look really good for them against the Minnesota Timberwolves, who were on the second leg of a back-to-back, -back. whatever, <laughs> whatever, it hit it overreact, and they look great. I'm actually recording this video while the Clippers and the Lakers are still going against each other, and the Lakers just went on a big run. But I, w I usually try to wait till the last games are over, but I even if the Lakers win this one or the Clippers win this one, I won't have nothing to say about this game, man. I legitimately won't. Uh, shout out to Dwight Howard. You know what I'm saying? That's what we got. I do got something to say. This game was 15 or 20 minutes longer than it needs to be because the officiating was so bad. I don't know what Carmelo Anthony was doing. Clippers win. All right, I'm going to transfer to the very next game, the double overtime Spurs versus Wizards game, the 310-point put-up game, the most points scored in a single game this season, 310. I was highly invested in this game because I picked a lot of the players in my prize pick entry um, to go over today. And guess what? We hit. I, I didn't think this game was going to go to double overtime or have 300 points scored. But, hey, I did my thing on this one. Shout out to Greg Popovich, man. Just two wins away from breaking the all-time record or tying the all-time record. I don't really know. They said it on the broadcast. I completely forget. Here are my notes for this game. Keldon Johnson, three-point sniper. It's like a lot of the shots Keldon Johnson took today as far as three-pointers. Some of them are, were like open, but some of them are highly contested. There was one where he pump faked, drew the man in the air, shot the three, and hit it. Four-point play. Keldon Johnson becoming a sniper is something I did not expect, and I don't know if it's going to last for the rest of his career because he's shooting like 42%. Or, or this is going to be like an anomaly year. But regardless, this is a dude that in early in his career, even early in the season, he, won't, he wouldn't even take more than like two threes a game. And now he took nine today and he hit five of them. And not to mention, he's also a bulldozer going to the basket. People are calling him Big Body Big body Kel. And I can see why. DeJounte Murray with the stat line of 31, 14, and 13 in this double overtime. And in the first half, he was incredible. And you saw why he was an all-star placement because he was, he was killing it. And then Wes Unsale decided to throw a double team. I guess somebody made some defensive adjustments, and because of that, DeJounte Murray struggled in the second half, but he did end up in the overtime making up for the things. It was like five seconds left on the clock in the fourth quarter, and he took an ill-advised shot, and I went to the Spurs subreddit to see what they were saying about that shot because it was like, Greg Popovich players don't be doing stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? We, we going to have some floppy action or something with five seconds to go. We going to run a play, not an isolation jack up a three-pointer. Uh, DeJounte Murray did that, and the subreddit wasn't very happy, but he came back. They won this game. Jacopoto is still one of the most under, um, Perto is still one of the most underrated players in the entire NBA. This man was killing the offensive glass. He had six offensive rebounds, and I feel like out of the six, five of them ended up with his little ugly hook shot. His hook shot does not look like it should go in, but it does, and he ended up with a 28, 11, and 8. He was so close to a triple-double, and I saw some people talking about his playmaking, when in reality, a lot of his eight assists were just like dribble handoffs, and whoever he gave it to, Lonnie Walker or Keldon 
Johnson just shot the ball. He did hit um, Doug McDermott on some back doors every once in a while, but it wasn't like he was out there looking like the Pal Gasol or something or Mark Gasol or something. It wasn't like he was throwing dimes at the center position. But assists are assists, so shout out to them. The OKC Thunder won a game today um, against the Pacers, just two of the biggest tanking teams in the league right now. Um, there was a time in this game, I, I kid you not, where I, I'm actually I got the tweet. Let me bring up my own tweet. I made a tweet that OKC's bench tonight consisted of Lindy Waters the third, Oliver Saar, and Vit Kretsch, the guy that I talked about in yesterday's video. If you missed it, um, and all three of those guys in the fourth quarter were on the court at the same time. Now. I mean, you you got to be deeper than an NBA diehard because I'm an NBA diehard, and all three of those players got a big old who from me. Shout out to my my broadcast boy homies. Um, I don't know who any of those dudes are, but the beginning of the fourth quarter, they decided to run them for like six minutes together. When they, and they didn't even have Shea on the floor. It wasn't like okay, it was Shea and some some people we don't know. It was like Theo Maladon is the fourth, and I think Alexei Pokusevsky is the fifth, and they won this game. Because Shea, whenever Shea puts his head down, there's nothing you can really do. He has his own style of play, and it's so amazing to me because he's not super fast. He's not super strong, but he gets to the basket at will. And Carmelo just hit a big shot. It's a five-point game with four minutes ago. Um, he just puts his head down and gets to the basket at will. He's drawing contact. I just love Shea Gibbs Alexander's play, man. I remember my first time watching him, and there's footage of this where House of Highlights hired me. This was like before, like when I first started working for House of Highlights. I was on like a, a three-month deal. It was like a trial run. And they're like, we want you to watch every single summer league game and commentate about it. I mean, I don't like summer league like that, but I, it's an opportunity to get a new job, sure. And I remember my very first game watching Shea Gillis Alexander. And in that video, I said, this is my guy. Of the, the very first, the very first summer league game I saw him because I'm not a, a college basketball watcher. So some of y'all were on a train when he was at Kentucky. I wasn't on that train because I didn't watch him at Kentucky. So the very first time I watched him play, I was like, yo, I ain't know if he was going to be a star or superstar, but I was saying he's going to be one of my favorite players. And he is that. Uh, let's talk about Trey Mann because Trey Mann continues to, to be one of the steals of the NBA draft so far. Just a fearless shooter. It, it doesn't matter if it's heavily contested or not. He will shoot that ball. And those are the type of players I like to watch too, especially on like a tanking team. Because what bro got to lose? The tanking teams, they got nothing to lose. So if he shoot three for 56 one game, it don't matter. They were trying to lose anyway. They won this one. And I think that the, the Pacers fans... Um, got that first taste of some of the things I always try to tell Reese about where he's just too passive sometimes. He ended up taking 10 shots, um, and this game went to overtime. But he should be taking more than 10 shots. Um, Ijax was great in this one, five blocks and hit, and hit a lot of shots. But Reese got to be stingy. I want him to be stingy. And I know he's a playmaker at heart, but I want him to be more stingy on the court. RJ ended up with 46 points, and you know what? He should have got his 50 if he hit more of his free throws. There was a couple times he went to the free throw line and he missed both. At least hit shoot 50%. Every time you go, nope, he missed both. And he, he could have got the 50 piece. None of it really really would have mattered because he did this thing where, like, we're going to allow RJ to score all the points. We don't really trust nobody else on the team. Um, and RJ did that. It, it was a I saw a tweet that was like, I think he had 30 points in the first half. And somebody tweeted, like, who's guarding RJ out there? And what the, the Miami Heat were doing was switching everything. So it was like Tyler Hero got some run. Duncan Robinson got some run. Kyle Lowry got some run. And RJ was just doing whatever he wanted. Got to the basket at will. He had some big shots. He just missed that 50 piece because he couldn't hit his free throws. But the Miami Heat do their thing. Uh, um, Tyler Hero coming off the bench, continuing his six-man of the year candidacy, and they get the win. The Pelicans beat the, the Suns on a back-to-back. Um, and this is a good game, man. Since C.J. McCollum has been traded to the Pelicans, I think he's averaging like 28 on crazy efficiency. Um, he, he's been really, really good for them. And today he ended up with 38 points. Brandon Ingram is looking good as the, the primary ball handler and playmaker. But I love that Jackson Hayes, since they put him in the starting lineup as the power forward, he's been looking good. Now, I know today he only ended with nine and six and two blocks, but he looks so very good out there. He's still super young and a, a, a block happy dude. So he's going to get into foul trouble a lot. But I like the progression that I'm seeing from Jackson Hayes in this season, especially since earlier in the year, he spent a lot of the time in the G. Um, and I guess it's not a bad thing anymore, man. The G League has produced a lot of good players. So some people spending time in the G is not like, oh, he sucks. Legitimately, sometimes it's for, for development. And he is starting to develop. I don't know what's going to happen with Zion eventually. But when I see what this team is doing and I'm like, plug Zion in here, then it could be it could be very interesting and very fun. I mean, it's very fun right now without Zion. Now, imagine ad, uh, adding a dude who averages 27 and gets his own rebounds and dunking all over the place. 
You got to get them healthy, though. Got to get them healthy, though. The Suns just didn't have a lot of gas today. Not a lot of help outside for Devin Booker on a back-to-back. -back. Don't need to read into it too much. And I watched the second half of Mavericks versus Jazz, and the Jazz pulled out with this. Donovan Mitchell was insanely clutch, and Rudy Gobert actually was holding his own on the perimeter against, like, Luka, which is dope. I feel like Luka could have scored way more in that fourth quarter or in the, in the clutch time in general, but he was just trying to shoot over Rudy Gobert instead of getting past Rudy Gobert. And I guess the one time he tried to get past Rudy Gobert, Rudy Gobert did, like, this double block regardless. The Mavericks... Um, it's cool to see Davis Burt's hands and, and Spencer Dinwiddie have pretty much their best games a part of the Mavericks, but it seems like every single season, there's a team that I despise when it comes to clutch situations, and this year, it is this team. I mean, it's just like, hey, Luca, please save us, please save us, and all of the stuff that we were doing earlier in the game for us to get to the point where it's a close game goes out the window, and uh, they just couldn't score down the stretch. They couldn't, and Donovan Mitchell was scoring everything. A nice lob from Mike Conley to Rudy Gobert to, to put the icing on the cake. The Lakers might win a game. Huh, how interesting is that? I, I mean, I don't, know, I don't know. I'm not waiting until the end of, of this game to wrap up my video. There's some other games that were on tonight. Like, I didn't watch the Rockets lose to the Magic, but I do see Chumo Kiki ended up with 26-9-4. That's interesting. And the Raptors got destroyed, even though Scotty almost had a 30-piece. But that's it. I'm going to go on here and finish watching this Lakers game. Uh, and hopefully you enjoy. Let me know in the comment section all the questions I asked about the Super Team. Um, how do you feel about James Harden's appearance or debut and all the other things that we talked about? I'll see y'all soon.